All right, episode number seven. And it's going to be an absolute barn burner because there's so much to talk about. And speaking of so much to talk about, let's get down to it. First and foremost, SF Silly season in the NASCAR world hasn't got any ridiculously weird or awkward, and or it just did. Just moments ago, as I'm recording it, like 10 minutes ago, I got the word and found out that GMS Racing and Johnny Sauter are no longer a thing. That means Sauter is a free agent, and that illustrious number 21 truck is vacant. Could this mean Brad Moffitt may be in the ride? Is there more than the imaginary? Or we're just going to see other drivers that are unqualified or underserving get to ride. That is yet to be decided or even announced because we're in the early stages of as to why Sauter got sacked from GMS Racing. For me, it's very simple. It's Brad Moffitt or bust for that 21 truck. It's quite fascinating and also unfathomable that the top four, the championship four drivers from a year ago are don't have a ride or got promoted. Half of them don't. That is Sauter and Moffitt, who, by the way, those two had the most wins in the truck series season. Essentially, they won half the season, almost half the season. And of course, the ones that are also gone are Noah Gregson and Justin Haley. The difference between Sauter and Moffitt is those two are free agents, whereas Haley and Gregson have Xfinity Series rides. Gregson with JR Motorsports and Justin Haley at College Racing. It's kind of... Who knows? Retirement? From what I understand, it may not be just retirement. There might be some tension or friction that might have led to the decision of GMS sacking Sauter. But you're looking at the Gander Outdoors Truck Series without your defending champion. And what I mean by that, you don't have the defending champion because they don't have a ride. Not for a promotion. It's once that you get promoted to another series on a national tour. That's fine. But when you have a free agent who is also the defending champion... It's not looking good for the truck series. And when you have the winning, one of the winningest drivers and one of the top tier guys of the series that's been there for the longest of time, a strong leader. Sure, his attitude, his behavior are, are one of the many detriments on the fans' eyes of how they view Johnny Sauter. Look no further than the 2007 short lived series that ABC aired about NASCAR when Sauter was in the number 70 hot CNC machine. If you remember that NASCAR series that was on ABC, You'll know what I mean by Sauter, and I've known it for a long time because of that show. But Sauter's a fierce heck of a driver, Vo the voiceless of the voiceless. He's not afraid to say anything what is on his mind. You don't see that very often in, in other lower series. You, you have your Kyle Busch's, your Kevin Harvick. Sauter is right up there. Sauter's a competitive driver. He's fierce. A lot of people don't like him, but at the same time, you cannot deny he's one of the best truck series drivers out there. And with Crafton, who struggled in the Fords, was I can understand why Sourceboard went to Ford because with BKR go, shutting down after 2017, there was no Ford represented other than Jesse Little. And Jesse Little has done a fine job in that 97 Ford. It would be curious to see how he fares in going to this season because I think he'll continue that momentum. So well, that's, at least that's like what I can hope so with. Jesse Little. But for now, it's Sauter, Moffitt, the top two free agents of NASCAR. Not just in trucks, all across the national tour. It doesn't get any bigger than those two right now. And who knows? The only, my opinion, the only way I would accept a new driver of that 21, if it's a proven driver, a talented driver who has yet, who hasn't been, like, look, look at, for example, a guy like Gus Dean or Austin Hill. More notably, Austin Hill, who will replace Moffitt in the 16 truck. Which, by the way, if you haven't looked at that number 16 truck, don't tell me that doesn't give you Joe Rudman buys with the good old number 18 Dana Dodge. Just get sure there's no yellow and red on the side, but it looks carbon copy like the Bobby Hamilton racing truck. Austin Hill was not a bad driver. He finished 11 of the points last season. He was one of the more better drivers that done a lot more with less. So, in my opinion, this is the season, 2019 will be the season to see if Hattori Racing are indeed for real. And Austin Hill deserves the ride. Those are the two big questions what I have with, with that combination. Can he deliver and prove that that championship was no fluke? That is going to be the huge question in mind. As far as who will be in the 21, for me, it's simple. Moffitt, or maybe, if it's not a paid driver... Like a Cody Coughlin or a, or Dalton Sargent, 
Austin Terrio would not be a bad choice. I know Kamikaze Games would approve that. Austin Terrio, there's, there's so many. This is we're in an era where I get it. Pay drivers are the norm, but we don't have your defending champion because of money, or you don't have the winningest driver at the moment. Which, in fairness, Sauter has been there for a long time. In fairness to those, to compare to Moffa, who's got a lot of years left under his belt, that I can see being back in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series. Proving himself that he's more than he was, the more than he was in 2015, which he won Rookie of the Year. Even if he eventually gets the cup, which I do hope so in the next three to five years, he's going to get the Alex Bowman treatment. And as far as saying, "Oh, he's a Cup rookie," when in reality, Moffin won Rookie of the Year in 2015. Bowman was around 24 since 2014. Ugh, don't even want to talk about that 2014 rookie class when you have. When he had what was it, Bowman, Ryan Truex, Parker Kligerman, all through all their careers got demoralized. Bowman had revived. Truex is done for. And Kligerman, at least he's got that NBC role. So we'll see. And who knows where that will lead eventually. At least he's made it back to Cup. Truex has just can't stay at a ride for more than one season. He finally did a calling before they decided, no, let's put Justin Haley instead. Doesn't like, Haley. I will say, he, yes, he got the three wins. They were all surprising. They were all out of nowhere. With the exclusion of Gateway, Most Sport, and Texas, those were Kyle Busch truck. Those were Gilliland's races to win. So keep that in mind. I'll talk more about Todd Gilliland over the next month or so regarding how this season he has to prove himself because last season in my eye was disappointing as all it can be in my, in my book. So yes, Sauter's out of a ride. Moffin doesn't have a ride. Gustine does. And so does Austin Hill. And which, by the way, Mike Seneca also has a ride. Don't let that don't let that haunt you. Mike Seneca has a truck ride. We'll see how long will that last. Alright, the next set of news was right, what I was gonna start off with was the NFC wildcard games. Why I'm not gonna talk about the AFC? Because the NFC is more of an interest because of where I'm from and who the teams were in the playoffs. Those are the Seattle Seahawks and the Dallas Cowboys. And the other one was the Chicago Bears and the Philadelphia Eagles, which hopefully if I can remember the transition from football to IndyCar in a moment, because that's the big news that came out today regarding their television deal and also a little tie-in with the NFL. So first off, let's get the monkey out of my back and let's talk about the Seahawks first. Unfortunately, they were eliminated by the Cowboys. There was some ref ball in ball. It was plainly obvious there was some ref ball, some questionable pass interference, a face mask that they didn't call early in the game. It was completely hogwash that whole entire game. It was frustrating to watch. What made it more frustrating is that once they got going, it was too little too late. At least Chris Carson had a lot of rushing yards that, that that game. I don't mind the running game. But when it came to momentum and, and for Russell Wilson, he struggled with three and outs left and right early on. And then, of course, uh, the two things that I'll remember more about that game instead of ref ball and Wilson struggling early on. Well, three things. The first one was K.J. Wright. How, how, how in the world he caught that interception? That was probably the most damnedest lucky interceptions he, he caught. It was beautiful. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Man, if only the Seahawks were to seal the deal and pull it off, that would have been great. But, ugh, Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott. Zeke was overfed, and Prescott was doing Ben Roethlisberger-like moves from Super Bowl 40. Luckily, he didn't, luck, I can't, I can't disrespect the Cowboys. They won. Sure, the refs might have helped a little bit, but that's my opinion. Oh, yeah. The second thing was, of course, Alan Hearns' horrific injury. Because when I was watching the game at Buffalo Wild Wings, I noticed noticed it right away. It was like, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. I know he got hurt. And then I looked at his feet. It's like, Jesus Christ, man. Excuse pardon me a little bit, but that's how I felt. It's like his foot was pointing up. It was pointing up. He was laying on stomach, stomach, stomach. Stomach forward, he was laying there, but his foot was pointing up instead of down, like as you would as you were laying down. Your stomach, gruesome injury. Hope for hope for the best, and that that, that was just gru- that was gruesome. It was it's the most gruesome injury I've seen in a while, not since Anderson Silva, 
and even not just Anderson Silva, even the one basketball player from Louisville. It's right up there as far as bizarre injuries that I just happened to see. I think compared to all of them, I, that's one I saw live. The other ones were after the fact, of course. So, of course, the best wish is out to Mr. Hearns. Hope for the best, and hopefully that does not mean the end of his NFL career. The same thing can be said about Alex Smith, who, in my opinion, was the better quarterback of the 49ers during that whole num Mr. Number 7 from Nevada era. They should have put him in the Super Bowl. They should have not given up on him in my book. At least he did what he did at Kansas to show that he was not going to be a bust. Is he a bust, or he's in the Vince Young category, a borderline, or to a big debate of who is a bust and what, whether or not that individual is a bust. Alex Smith to me is, isn't. He's in the Vince Young category of borderline though at the same time. So the biggest news I wanted to talk about is Janikowski. Who I, I had big expectations because this is the problem with Seattle Seahawks. They got rid of Hashka. After, in my opinion, I think what led a lot to it was of course money. Not just money. But I think that tie, the horrible, stupid tie, which I hate more, most about NFL than kickers, are ties against the Cardinals. That didn't help his cost. It, didn't, it added insult to injury to Hoska, was part of the Buffalo Bills that made the playoffs. They should have not even made it because of how garbage they were the following season. And the reason, because of the Buffalo Bills, the Seattle Mariners have the longest playoff drought. So I have no, I have, I can't sympathize with the Buffalo Bills. So they're on my shit list. Or, excuse me again. Buffalo Bills are on, are on that list for that reason. But Janikowski, man, the moment he made those two, the first two field goals, and when Fox showed the camera on him, I just knew it was like, Janikowski, stop being so cocky. You have a big game. I still don't trust you enough this season that you'll help us. You're the make it or break a deal guy. And of course, the make it or break a deal guy, guess what he did? He missed the field goal. Not just he missed the field goal, he got injured. And now, because of his injury, his career, his illustrious career, is pretty much over. It's pretty much over. It's done. It's damaged goods. It's safe, it's safe to say that the Seattle Seahawks is where kickers' dreams and aspirations go to die. Look at look, the fact that we went from Hoshka to Blair Walsh, massive downgrade. And then we got to do a big upgrade because it doesn't get any bigger than, Jan than Janikowski. It's just annoying that he's been struggling. Seriously, Janikowski, biggest disappointment of the NFL season in my book. And here's another thing about kickers. Cody Parkey, I don't care if it was tipped. It was ruled as a block. I don't care. Cody Parkey is garbage. He's the worst NFL kicker since Blair Walsh. He's probably surpassed Blair Walsh. Sure, he may have made every field goal to that point. Sure, he might have been a contributing role throughout the Bears season, no doubt. They maybe made it help him get into the postseason, which, heh, no. Trubisky, Mack, and others played a big role on that Bears season, not so much part. In fact, he's being paid $9 million, which I had to check to see where he ranks compared to others. He's nowhere near Goskowski. He's nowhere near Tucker or Janikowski money, even Vinatieri. I'm pretty sure Pat McAfee may have earned more money than him. When he was playing in the NFL before he became the super comedic video that reacts to everything on Twitter and NXT commentator. Janikowski is garbage. Period. Chicago booed him out of the out of the stadium, deservedly so in my eye. You just cannot mess up this many times this se in one season and expect to be sympathized by the large crowd. Yes, he might have got, he might have got nice. Yes, it was blocked. Yes, there's frame-by-frame frame footage close-up that shows it by Trayvon Hester. But the fact I was more frustrated at the fact because I know a couple Bears fans. I follow multiple Bears fans on Twitter. There's one big one in particular. Who I got blocked for about five minutes. But then I got unblocked and all that. But then I understood. It was like, yep, I figured heat of the moment. I was already frustrated over something else that made that, that, that didn't help. Because I pretty much, but I was on, I was inside. But of course, heat of the moment, frustrations and anger, it doesn't matter. And the fact that his interview was absolutely stupid. In my opinion, 
in my opinion. Oh, I was battling the win. Who the, who the hell do you think you are, Dale Earnhardt? Oh, Earnhardt can see the win. I can believe that. I don't believe what Parky said. There was barely any win factor in that game. Throughout the telecast on NBC, they said win is not going to be a factor. Win, non, little to no factor. Yes, it's the Windy City, but at the at the time before it was ruled a block and the footage and close-up form was shown, at that moment of time, it was still ruled as a missed field goal. His, his post-game comments were absolutely garbage in my book. Just oh up, just oh up, oh sunshine and rainbows, no. Chicago they ever have every right to eviscerate him in my eye. Yeah, they have every right to eviscerate him. I would too if I was a full-on flesh bear fan. That's why I'm super critical about Blair Walsh and super critical about Janikowski. Just anybody who's a place kicker. I even said last year that why did the Seahawks didn't sign Austin Rico? Austin Rico from the good old state of Idaho, from good old Central Valley of Spokane, Washington. He would have not been a bad choice. Man would have given him an opportunity. If you want a big re, if you wanted to. If you wanted a competent kicker for the future, you could have been in. Nope, he's in the AAF. He's in the AAF like multiple vandals are. Which, by the way, I found out yesterday that Scooter did, did uh, had an Idaho shirt. Because, you know, Scooter. The only reason why is because Idaho played Florida, which I had no clue that happened because I, I can't support them going to the FCS. I could not support them as an FCS team. I still think it's stupid. And when I did a radio show talking about the move, that was the most insincere, dishonest feeling I ever did. And it was some of the most dishonest writing I've done as a, as a journalist. I did it for the sake of sugarcoating. And, because, and I absolutely hate the move. And the sermon links, oh, they struggled. I can't, sympathize, I can't sympathize on the Petrinos. I can't sympathize on the fact they moved to the FCS. I can't sympathize on the fact that the direction of the university has gone. Call me bitter, call me pride, I don't give a damn. I don't like it. You know also what I don't like? How society can be sometimes when it comes to a public to opinion on social media. Because well, the moment I was upset about Janikowski getting hurt, it was heat of the moment. Some people don't get heat of the moment. When someone's feeling heat of the moment, acknowledge the heat of the moment. When you look back at it a day later and not know it was heat of the moment, even after the fact that I said it was heat of the moment, you didn't seriously need to shut the fuck up. Seriously. I don't, I don't, I don't care. I don't care if we're in good terms, mediocre terms, or we've been strayed for the past five years. I don't care. Because nobody's going to shut me up when it comes to how I feel about an NFL game. Especially when it's not on Twitter. Twitter, I keep I keep it mundane. Sure, sometimes I say something and eventually retract it for the sake because because I can uh, pull that stuff off. Eventually, down the road, I cannot be pulling that retraction stuff off. But when I get when I get frustrated, I get frustrated. And Janikowski got me to the point of massive frustration because Janikowski has been inconsistent all season. Janikowski has been inconsistent. This is the bottom line. Him getting hurt doesn't didn't do any favors, and I've definitely changed the dynamic of the whole entire football game for the Seahawks where Dixon, not Scott Dixon, Dixon, our punter can't even make a damn field goal if it's like dependent on it. That's why the Seahawks, the one smart thing they did, didn't rely on special teams the rest of the game. They gambled, it didn't work, but hey, it's better than just being more angry about Dixon and wondering why the hell is he an all-pro. The fact I was told that I'm better than that, blah, 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 and blah, know how to manage my sickness. Like, no, no, I, go blow, uh, I'll blow smoke up your ass and tell you sure. But essentially deep in mind, it's like, man, fuck you. So, 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 seriously, get a grip. Let me be. I'm not going to sugarcoat my opinions. And then I immediately on Twitter, I put sugar, sugarcoating my opinions, eh? With the Kyle Bush Jeff from Bristol. Because I was like, no, I'm not gonna change. I'm not gonna change the fact you weren't there. You weren't there during the low times. Where were you in the low times? Where were you when we needed you? Or when I needed you? Or when the whole family needed you? You weren't there, so I can't sympathize with the fact. One, I can't sympathize with you for that reason. And two, you tell me 
to sugarcoat it and learn about whatever. No. No, fuck up my lawn. Let me be. Because whether is no, this is a shoot. No, no, this is a shoot. You may think it was one thing to do every, uh, NASCAR TV graphics when I'm being kayfabe. And it was half, half legit and mostly sarcasm. This is pure legit shoot. Where were you? You were there. Out of all people, you have the least deserving right to tell me how to act or how to sugarcoat my opinions. Sugarcoat, if anybody sugarcoats my opinions uh, on a personal level, why I find it personal and doesn't understand heat in the freaking moment. I'm not going to acknowledge you. No, I'm not. You can forget. You can forget. Take your, your better than that manners. And take it to somewhere else. Give it to Halsey for all I care. That's one person that need that's that needs to be lectured. Halsey, the fact that she has a number one hit in America is an absolute atrocity, absolute hogwash. It is an absolute disgrace. This shit on the shit cake. Halsey is nothing but a Ellie Golding knockoff. It's blatant. Shane Smokers as well are blatantly ripped off Ellie Golding. When I get to number one in garbage, I'm gonna eviscerate. I'm gonna eviscerate the one that the, the song that the, those two made. That was completely obviously they ripped off Ellie Golding. Halsey's a tryhard model. Oh, I don't even want to say. I don't even want to say it. I'm gonna sugarcoat that. I'll, I'll sugarcoat that. This Halsey's a want. It's a Billy Ray Cyrus's daughter wannabe. Halsey, from what I saw videos and what I've heard, is an absolute nut job. I don't find her appealing. I don't find her music any good. The fact that without me, uh, uh, when I type in without me, her song has popped up as a priority. Get the hell out of here. No. What I, if, you're, if you're listening to this, do me a favor. I don't, do, I, I don't ask favors at, hardly at all. Hashtag, fr, hashtag Obi tries for life. No, 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 no. Hashtag free Obi Trice. Because here's why I mean by Obi Trice. If you listen to Eminem's without me, Obi Trice, real name, no gimmicks. Put some respect on Obi Trice with hashtag free Obi Trice. No, even better, respect Obi Trice. There, that's much better and it sounds more, it makes more sense. Hashtag respect Obi Trice because God damn it, Obi Trice deserves some respect to his name. Do me a favor as well. Let's do me a favor. Keep the M&Ms without me alive. Sure, Suicide Squad helped. Keep that song alive because to me, that will be the only without me title I'll ever acknowledge. Screw the housey song. Zero out of ten. Instant. Worst song of 2019. I can bank on that. And I think it's, and it's definitely going to be in my top ten worst 2018 songs that top the charts. And also, in addition to that, we're in an era where Baby Shark cracked the top 40. Don't believe me? Yes, I just said it. Baby Shark is in the top 40. Todd in the Shadows may say, oh, Kenny G was making top 40 in 87? Sure, then Kenny G, okay, that's, okay, whatever. Kenny G, Kenny G was popular at the time. That kind of music, you don't expect the shark. But Baby Shark in the top 40? Don't get me wrong. Baby Shark has holds a special place because that was a camp tradition when I used to be a junior counselor years ago. I can't disrespect that record. But I find it laughable that Baby Shark is in the top 40 and Halsey is number one. What a weirdo time to be alive. Seriously. Are we going back to the novelty days where like Disco Duck... Pac-Man Fever, MacGyver, and that truck song, Harper Valley PTA, were, were doing really well in the charts, some of them number one. This is the most this is the most bizarre time period for number for top 40 hits since probably Nickelback having how, how you remind me top of the charts and was song of the year in 2002. Yes, Nickelback had song of the year. According to Billboard, in 2002, not Metallica, not Def Leppard, not Poison, 
I don't know about poison, though. I'm gonna have to double check. I think every rose made have done something of note. Nickelback. We're in an era of K-pop cracking the top 42. Christmas songs from half a century ago cracking the top 10. Which, of course, back in the day, it was all about sales. These days, it's generally about airplays and so on and so forth. They changed it. So that's why you see Mariah Carey's Christmas song from the 90s in the top five. And, of course, when someone dies like Prince, you'll have a couple of them peaking all time in 2016. After Prince died in 2016, you had a couple songs that were in the top five in the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Probably the highest it ever charted ever sometimes but yeah we're in an era where Halsey disgracefully is number one Baby Shark a children novelty song in the top 40 and K-pop growing a movie I don't care what song it is as long as whichever song dethrones Halsey it will get a biased rating when I talk well, yes, when I, I'm super biased sometimes no, uh, when I do my video, no, uh, it's not going to be super biased except for a couple records. Panda will be a super biased rating for what it did and what it knocked. Stronger by Kanye West has a big high rating for what because it knocked the song that I find one of the worst ever and the most overrated. Oh, oh, ho, ho. 2006 to 2009. You're not going to like my opinions about those number one songs. Especially 2007, 2008 of note. And when I look back at the song, which was the first number, first new number one song of the final year of the decade, I didn't count songs that were number one that goes back to the end of the previous year. Like every Rose Has a Sword was number one in late at the end of '88 and early '89. I don't count that as the first song of '89. Me first new song that didn't top the chart in '88. '59 was the Christmas song by the album and the Chipmunks. 69. Nice. Sorry, I had to t- toss that in there. Crimson and Clover. Trippy song when it's in full length. 79 was the song from the Bee Gees that I can't remember the top of my head. 89 was My Prerogative by Bobby Brown. 99, All You Ever Had. If, as I think that's the title by Brandy. Not too crazy about 90s R&B all that much. Especially Brandy. 09, Just Dance. Safe to say, A Star Was Born. Lame joke. And then we come to without me. You see, the, you see the music regressing in quality for the most part? More about it when I get going with number one in excellence and number one in garbage later in the year. Now I can talk about IndyCar. Because during the Bears and Eagles game, we saw an IndyCar commercial. An IndyCar commercial on national TV? On NBC? Was it about IndyCar? Was it just a 500? It was just a 500. And a lot of NTT data footage. Yes, NTT data. You'll be hearing more about NTT data next week. But yes, IndyCar on NBC is an Indy 500 commercial. But hey, an IndyCar commercial in in an NFL game that was watched by 35 million people. The Cowboys and Seahawks were 25. They were number two. Interesting, the two most interesting games were the ones I watched. And ultimately, it had the highest ratings. So essentially, at one point or the other, within that range, people saw, might have saw the IndyCar commercial. It caught me off guard. It's like, oh wait, IndyCar? It was like, oh man, IndyCar commercial on NBC? Nice. That's what they should do. That's what they, that's what they have to do. Because... If they're good, if it's NBC, if they want to be themselves like the mod, the new speed channel or speed vision, however you want to call it, this is a step in the right direction. Now that we found out today, as I'm recording it, I don't know when it'll go up. You'll, you'll know when it'll go up. That there's going to be a 60% increase of IndyCar coverage. As a matter of fact, eight races will be on NBC and nine will be on NBC Sports Network. The first NBC race will be the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. Which in my eyes thinking, why can it not why 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 not St. Pete? Why not Long Beach? Long Beach is a prestigious race. And then when I saw the the schedule, it's like, makes sense. 
What? No, what? Start big. Start big. Start. Why not start the first NBC race at the most glorious track in the world, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? I say that's a great decision for IndyCar to be the NBC's main network. The first telecast will be the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. Sure, am I, I, I don't I have mixed feelings about the Grand Prix of Indianapolis being part of the month of May. It should honestly just be Indianapolis 500 a couple weeks of qualifying with bump day on the last day instead of bump day, day one, and then for the poll in day two. It's just my opinion, but this is excellent. 60% extra coverage. First NBC telecast of the new of the new TV deal. Indianapolis doesn't get any better bigger than that. Another uh, here are here are the races that will be on NBC. Hopefully I get them, hopefully I get them right. The Grand Prix of Indianapolis, the Indianapolis 500, both Bell Isle races, Road America, the final two races of the season, which will be Portland. And Mazda Laguna Seca. <clears throat> Wetter Tech Laguna Seca. Sorry, I'm an old fart. I counted eight. Hold on a second. Let me go check it out real quick to see which one NBC will do. Okay, it's mid Ohio. I'm so it's both Indianapolis races, both Bell Isle races, the final two races of the IndyCar season, Road America and Mid Ohio. I had to double check. I had to pause the recording to say that right now, but those are big races. The fact that is split really well compared to say NASCAR that's an excellent sign for IndyCar and with the pending announcement of not only the Indianapolis 500 provider sponsor yes there's gonna be a provide uh, uh, so yeah we're gonna have the Indianapolis 500 presented by or powered by X Y and Z similar to back in the day with the Daytona 500 when it had for Three years, it was the, from 91 to 93, the Daytona 500 presented by STP, or the Daytona 500 by STP. 2001 is technically called the Daytona 500 presented by Dodge. That's a good sign. I'll be it for me as a purist and traditionalist, when there's a, pro, a, a sponsor, it's kind of weird, awkward, because I still gotta call it the Daytona 500 or the Indianapolis 500. And, what, and if somehow NASCAR goes back to IRP, I still call it Indianapolis Raceway Park. I, I, Lucas Oil Raceway Park is actually what it is called. But if as long as they have the Kroger 200, I'm going to call it Kroger 200. If it's anything else but the Kroger 200, I'm still going to call it the Kroger 200. It's just like, I'm still going to call Safeco Field what it was, not T-Mobile Park. Apples and oranges in my book, but IndyCar's title sponsor. Could be soon. That's what a lot of people saw yesterday. That it was going to be the new sponsor. No, it's been said it was about NBC and NBC only. The only the only nitpick is of course Long Beach being on NBCSN, which in my is one of IndyCar's biggest races of the years. One, next to Indianapolis, it's Long Beach in my book. But I get it. I totally understand that. That is the wisest decision to kickstart NBC's new era on the main network. With Indianapolis. And of course, I looked at it a little further. NHL playoffs start during that time period when Long Beach is around the schedule. And Long Beach will be the final race before the month of May. So, it'll be interesting to see if somebody can pull the three-peat. Win Long Beach and sweep Indianapolis. More importantly, for Pocono... Can, can they pull all four? Those are the many, many questions and things I'll be keeping an eye on throughout the IndyCar season. And speaking of Long Beach, stay tuned for more later on with this series as far as Long Beach. Now, because when I was looking up the IndyCar TV schedule for which ones are going to be on NBC's main, main network, apparently from what I've heard, Brett Moffitt will be Johnny Sauter's replacement in the twenty one. I haven't checked on social media. I probably will know after I'm done recording whether or not it's all but confirmed or going to be confirmed that Moffitt will replace Sauter for the 2019 campaign. And the question will now be where will Sauter go? There are not many rides available. My, my assumption, what I believe will make sense to me is 
If if DGR Crossley talk to Sauter, if they talk to Sauter, put him in Tyler Ankrum's truck for the first couple races, including Daytona. Sauter's a master of Daytona. He's got multiple wins there. If they put him in a DGR truck, I think that would be good business. And at the very least, we'll get to see Sauter a couple more times. Because why I'm saying Tyler Ankrum's truck, the 17, why I'm saying Tyler Ankrum, Tyler Ankrum is not eligible to run the first couple races, similar with Todd Gilliland last year, because he's 17 years old. He doesn't turn 18 until later on, which, for if I recall, Ankrum's case is Martinsville. He'll be ready to go going forward. Gilliland had to wait till Charlotte to run the rest of the season. So, makes sense to me. Put Sauter in the DGR truck. And then maybe there you can help Natalie Decker, who will be in the 54 at Daytona. More likely than not, I'm probably either going to put David in the truck or it's going to be Bo Lamastis. Well, that'd be something with Bo Lama- if Johnny Sauter were to join DGR because Le- Bo Lamastis and Johnny Sauter don't have the best history. Dating back to Atlanta where Johnny Sauter referred Bo Lamastis as a squirrel because he was so slow. That's why some people call him Slow Mastis. That would be an interesting... But hey, you never know. Look at Kurt Busch and Tony Stewart. They were teammates eventually. Anything can happen in NASCAR, no matter what. And it is true. Even in a time where it's become predictable, anything can happen. So yeah, let's go quick. do a quick rundown. Johnny Sauter is out of GMS Racing. More likely, from what I see, Brett Moffer is going to be the replacement. Halsey is garbage. Janikowski's career may be over. Cody Parkey is trash no matter what. IndyCar on NBC. This leads me to the KNN West schedule. It's finally released. The season opener will be indeed the Las Vegas Dirt Track. I think it's been confirmed. Also, Irwindale is back on the KNN West calendar. Not just Irwindale. You'll also have returns from Sonoma, Evergreen, and Meridian. They're going to be back. The dual races will be in Iowa in junction with the Xfinity Series. And the other one will be a gateway in junction of the IndyCar Weekend. This leads me, what is the finale? It is not at Kern County. Kern County loses a date, by the way, because Kern had two, which was the season opener last year that Kevin Harvick ran, Haley Deegan, and the race that Harvick was impressed by Haley Deegan. And also the race that Todd Gilliland and Harrison Burton had an epic battle. Memory serves correctly. No. Was it that? I think I'm confusing it with New Smyrna. I think that's what it is. New Smyrna the, in Florida in the east. That's probably the confusion. More than likely. I apologize. But at least the Harvick and Deegan thing is correct. Phoenix. Phoenix International Raceway or Jeff Gordon Raceway or Phoenix Raceway. Now known as ISM Raceway in Amadeo, Arizona will be the finale and the nostalgia kicked in. The good old Southwest days will be reminisced. Because back in the day, in the 90s, the Southwest finale was in Phoenix. You had some interesting carnage, interesting wrecks, and interesting winners. Ron Hornaday, before he had the Hollywood, before he had the Hollywood look, Ron Hornaday, when he looked like Paul Newman, and so on and so forth, back in the before he was signed by DEI to run in the truck series. He, he won the championship by simply pushing the car to the start finish line because there was a big carnage wreck that ended the race heading out at the turn, at when it was known at the time, turn four. Now is exit of turn, I think it's turn three now. The, the old front stretch. I have to figure out how am I going to refer Phoenix to X, Y, and Z and all that eventually. But that happened. You also had an interesting race in 1998 where Stan Hansen was driving for Ken Schrader. That was good, getting darker and darker by the minute. That's what it reminds me. In my opinion, they should. Canine West should have never left Phoenix. They shouldn't. It's just the anything West in Phoenix, late in the season, deep in the season, especially now as the championship race, can't get any bigger than that. And then maybe going down the road, like you saw with Derek Cross last year, could we possibly see Haley Deegan make her truck debut at Phoenix? That's the big question a lot of people have. Like. When will when will it be? If it doesn't happen at any point this season, I'm guaranteed it will happen at Phoenix. Which, by the way, the Canon West finale will be after the Xfinity race. 
So yeah, we have a quadruple header going to Phoenix. And as far as what is the plan for Canada and West coverage, that is still up in the air, but I have one side that may not be quite as ideal, but I'll figure out a way to fix, to f solve it and keep it around the realms, to say the least. It may be on this show. So final thoughts going into to the NFC and AFC divisional games. And also we're pushing mid-February. We're now in the second week of 2019. Silly season has been weird so far. We have a wrestling company that's trying to become elite. Will it live up to the hype? Will Jericho and Pac, no, formerly known as Neville, be the, the intention grabber? Then TV networks will be, all right, we'll get them. Will Kenny Omega be there? Will CM Punk? I doubt CM Punk. But the way that we're going about it is they were taking low-key shots on the WWE. And when it comes to the WWE, Manny Rose, 10 out of 10. That little segment that I saw on Twitter, 10 out of 10. That's all I'm going to say about the, the WWE because, as I said, I haven't watched since May. And I just only can only hope that Mandy Rose eventually will get over. Just like how I'm trying to get over the hump the known as the racing world of YouTube. Because it takes time, dedication, a lot of feelings and appearance to be let out. To express yourself out there. When you express yourself, let it be known that people will love you people will hate you as long as you have valid reasons and you back it up it will be fair what happened with me with the Janikowski thing that was complete garbage some opinions about AEW including one particular YouTuber that should just stick to audio and should reviews give it a chance you are the mark what makes you any better I'm optimistic of a whole... Uh, no, not optimistic. More or less curious how AEW will fare. But at this moment in time, professional wrestling will never be the same. It will never be what it was in the 80s and 90s when Hulkamania, Stone Cold, The Rock, The Monday Night Wars, NWO, and so on were. Oh, the Macho Man I cannot leave him out. Or Ric Flair, Sting, Andre, Warrior, Bret the Headman Hart, Shawn Michaels, so on and so forth. Scott Steiner, Express it. If you want to be vocal, just back it up with facts and validity. For me, with Janikowski, is because I've seen it. I've noticed it. I know how I felt at the time. While I'm still not happy with the fact of what happened to Janikowski, I still stick to my own gun that it was pathetically frustrating for me to witness that. No one should tell me otherwise. Some I can get. But if it's completely out of line or ridiculous, or it's just that hit me personal, especially when you were not there over the years, when we needed you, when I needed you, you could back back it up two steps, and I'll shut the door. I may be just known as a red flag man. I may just be known as a TV graphic guy. Hopefully, eventually, I'd be known as a journalist in the grand scheme of things, but also a strong-minded, opinionated human being that talks about racing, football, music. And so on. This is no this is no renaissance. This is just the beginning of something greater. And you're about to find out how I'm gonna pull it off. You're either with me or against me. If you're along with the ride, I guarantee you and I'll promise you it will be worth it at the end. You can bank on it better. Anyways, that will do it here for you thinking with you think you know me. So make sure, as you see on the social media plugs, Instagram, Twitter, make sure you give it a good old follow because if you want to see a little bit in-depth of what, uh, what I do for a living, what I'm going to end up doing, and also later down the road where I'm at, those are the two outlets for it. Those are the best outlets to follow me by. Sure, I'll put video content on YouTube and keep doing red flags and all of that, but hey, you want to see the world through my hands and from my view? Those two outlets are it. So without further ado, thank you for listening. And until we meet again, let's hope this time around without the Seahawks in it, there'll be no rage. But I'm not going to chase the fact that I'm probably going to bury a kicker or two if they mess it up or cost them big in the playoffs. 
So, catch you guys later. But I'm really gonna have to check right now if Moffat is gonna replace Sauter.